You know, he's only been playing three months. <laughs> Impressive. I learned that about Kurt last night at the couples thing, so, yeah. Uh, it's great to see everybody this morning. I'm going to possibly be swigging some water. I'll tell you, I moved to Columbus, and I get sicker, like, more times than I have in the past uh, 29 years that I did not live in Columbus. So y'all have, like, the, what is it that keeps you from getting sick? Immune system. <laughs> Cindy, you always help me up there. <laughs> but you guys have like an amazing immune system. Apparently mine is not so great, but I have been fighting a cough, so we're going to hope that I do not break down just coughing nonstop this morning. Uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3 this morning. Uh, for those of you who might not have been with us uh, through this series, we are going through the letters to the church, and these are the seven letters that Jesus Christ has written to the church in the book of Revelation, and we are on our last letter, and this one is to the church in Laodicea. And what we need to see as we always come before, uh, come to these passages, is to remember that they are written to a specific church at a specific time, but that their message still applies to us, even though we are years later. Remember, the Word of God is living and active. It is never not relevant to our lives today. And so if you'll stand, we will open up with our reading in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14, and we will go through verse 22, and then we will open in prayer. And it says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, that says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white car garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father God, we thank you so much again that we have the freedom to come here and openly read your word, that everybody here is able to have your word in front of us and that we can read it daily and that you speak to each one of us individually. And so God, I pray that in this time you do that. And God, we know that you are speaking. I pray that we open our hearts to receive the message that you have to say. And God, I pray that you speak through me. Let me be the vessel and remove any distraction or anything that I might do to get in the way so that your word may be proclaimed. We love you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. And so we're wrapping up these letters this morning, and this, this one might be one of the more popular letters to the seven churches. It seems like everybody might know what this, le or what this church is, even if you're not able to specifically say, yeah, that's the church. It, it seems like it is the one that people are pretty familiar with. But this letter to the church of the Laodiceans, Jesus has nothing good to say about them. As we just read through there, there was no commendation. There was no encouragement. There was no, hey, you guys are doing this great. It was only negative things said about them. And as I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this church, and what might have been going through their head as they've been reading this, and, or as they're getting ready to read this, because it says at the end of each letter, he who has an ear, let him hear what he says to the churches. And so I feel like each of these seven churches probably were able to read what the other letters were written to the other churches. It wasn't just specifically to them, but all the churches were able to hear and read them. And so I can see these letters collectively being read in the front of the church of Laodicea, and I can hear them kind of thinking right after because Philadelphia was the church we looked at last week. And remember, Jesus had nothing negative to say about the church in Philadelphia. He only had praise for them and rewards. And, you know, he praised them because they were weak. And we saw that the church in Smyrna, they were physically poor, but Jesus said, no, 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 be, you guys are actually rich. 
Even though you may appear poor, you are rich. And then we come to today's church, and I can see that, or Laodicea is pretty much everything that Smyrna was not. So Smyrna was poor. Smyrna was not necessarily wealthy, but yet we see that Laodicea is those things. And the city is this great banking center, and they're known for their wealth. They had temples, and they had theaters, and there was even a major medical school in the city. They were known for manufacturing this wool. They had black sheep there, and it manufactured this really soft wool that was used for burial clothing. They were known throughout the entire Roman Empire for this wool. The medical school that they had, they actually produced eye salve that you were, it was like a dust that you could put on your eyes and it would help your vision. And they were also well known for this. People came all over to receive help in these areas. They had a great gold reserve, so much so that in AD 60, a like, massive earthquake almost wiped out the entire city and the Roman emperor said, hey, we will give you help. We will give you funds to help. And they said, no, 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 we got this covered. We can take care of ourselves. We don't need help. And so they were so wealthy that they were able to rebuild completely on their own. And Barclay, he said they didn't need, nor did they want or even accept outside help. He said Laodicea was too rich to accept help from anyone. Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us, Laodicea arose from the ruins through the strength of her own resources with no help from us. So imagine being the church of Laodicea, and here you're reading about Philadelphia, and you're hearing, oh, God is so proud of Philadelphia. God is so pleased with Philadelphia. They, they're weak, but God sees them as strong. They're poor, but God sees them as actually being rich. And in my mind, I could kind of see Laodicea kind of like, all right, I cannot wait to hear what Jesus is going to say about us. If he's loving those churches, because I do this all the time, if they are so proud of that person, wait till they hear about what I've done. We get into that mindset. And so they're, they're, I can see them just like maybe like feeling pretty good about themselves. Like we are so ready to hear what he's going to say about us. I mean, we are self-sustaining. We don't rely on anybody else. We have it all under control. And so... They hear what Jesus says, and they're waiting for the praise. They're like, all right, Jesus, tell us how great we are. And then Jesus says the words, and not a single one of them is good. From the very beginning, Jesus is like, no, 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 you guys. He says in Revelation 3.15, as he says with all the churches, I know your deeds. And he says, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. I wish you were cold or hot. And then we see in verse 16, Jesus calls them lukewarm and that he wants nothing to do with them. He would rather spit them out of his mouth. And the truth is, whenever, we, whenever this term would have been heard by the people in Laodicea, they would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because a lot of times, I, I read a lot of scholars that they were talking about Luke, or, you know, hot is like, we are so on fire for God, and cold is, well, I want nothing to do with God, and God really wants you to choose, you know, either be, just reject God completely, or be all for God. But I don't think if you're in the context of it, that is what they would have understood it as. Because Laodicea, in all its splendor, they had one problem, and it was their water system. Their water system was horrible. They couldn't even have a good water supply. It was always tepid. It was always uh, lukewarm. You couldn't do anything with it. I watched one guy, he was talking about uh, the pipe still, and you can go to Laodicea and you can see their pipes and there are still like two inches of just minerals encrusted inside the pipes because of their horrible water system. It's just full of minerals. It's like if you would go to Pittsburgh and drink their water. Blech without a filter. I live there. I can say that. I used to live there. But so they had this horrible water system, and they had to rely on springs coming from another location. And one was called Hierapolis, and it was known for its hot baths. People would come from all over to sit in these baths. And the water was warm. It came from a natural hot spring, and they fed into these baths right by the public gate. And so the hot water is helpful for the people. And that is where Laodicea was trying to receive some of their hot water. 
And then another city, not too far away from Laodicea, was called Colossae. And this is the one famous for the letter that Paul wrote to the city of Colossae, or the book of Colossians. And this city was located at the base of mountains. And at the peak of the mountains, there was pretty much always snow. And as some of you know, when snow melts, it is refreshing, and it brings down this really cold stream. And there would be hundreds of them flowing down. And so visitors would go to this city to receive some of the cold, refreshing water from Colossae. And it was energizing, and it would invigorate them. And it made me think as I was reading that, I went hog hunting a couple weeks ago, and I mean, we hiked and hiked and hiked. It was like 10 and a half miles that we had already hiked, and then we were still going to hike a couple more, and I brought one bottle of water. And as we're going, I just drank it all. And then we were at about mile number 10 and a half, and I was like, I am so stinking thirsty, but I'm not about to drink his water. And so it was like, what am I going to do? And I remembered one spot where we had climbed a bluff. There was trickling water because it had snowed that day. And you could just get it trickling right off this bluff. And so it was like, I am going to go there. And I went and I filled my water bottle up and it was so cold and it was so refreshing. And it was like, oh, that's some of the best water I've ever had. And I got no bugs from it. I'm still alive today. So it was good. It was a blessing from God. But this is the water that Colossae had. And so the people talked about how if you go to Colossae, you can get this cold, refreshing, invigorating water. And so you have Colossae with its cold water. You have Hierapolis with its hot water. And then you look at Laodicea. And they have no drinking water, really. They have no water supply that is good. It's tepid. And so what they did is they built aqueducts so that they could get the water from Hierapolis, and they could get the water from Colossae. But the problem is they're six miles away from both of these towns. And so by the time that water has flowed down, the hot water, by the time it gets to them, is lukewarm. It's warmed up through the day. And then the cold water, as it's flowing down to them, it's warmed up. So by the time it gets to them, they just have plain water. And I've been thinking and knowing what I'm talking about, I, I've kind of been like, when I take showers, it's like, ooh, I love hot water. And if I want to wake up, ooh, I love cold water. And I tried taking like a lukewarm shower and it was like, uh, that is just horrible. I don't like that at all. And so they know what lukewarm is and they know it does nothing good. Cold water has a purpose. Hot water has a purpose. So when Jesus tells this church, you are neither hot nor cold, they would have known exactly what he's talking about. You, we can't do anything with you. We can't drink you. You don't help us with energy. You don't help us when we're in pain. You do nothing good. You are useless. So what made this church lukewarm? Why would Jesus tell them, you are neither hot nor cold? I wish that you were one or the other. Revelation 3.17 said, Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and blind and naked and poor. And so it could be that this church is lukewarm because they totally relied on themselves. We have no need for anybody else. We have no need to do anything. We have it all under control. Jesus just praised Philadelphia for being so weak that they needed to rely on God. Maybe he's condemning or he's, he's uh, criticizing Laodicea because they think they are so good that they have no need to rely on Jesus. Paul told us as we looked at in 2 Corinthians 12 last week, he said, power is perfected in weakness. And then at the end of verse 10, for when I am weak, then I am strong. But this church, maybe they didn't rely on Jesus. Maybe they thought they had it all under control. And it's even possible, maybe they thought that their wealth distinguished them, that they had pride in what they had. Maybe they were beginning to be an empty religion. Their faith was not in God, but rather in their stuff. And so their faith in God was empty words. Yes, I believe in God, but I'm going to rely on my stuff. Almost sounds like an American view. Yeah, there is a God, but I'm actually going to rely on my job, or I'm actually going to rely on my house, or whatever it is. 
Their lives did not show fruit. David Guzik, he said, the lukewarm Christian has enough of Jesus to satisfy a craving for religion, but not enough for eternal life. Yeah, I believe there's a God, that is enough. Well, Jesus tells us even the demons believe. So they don't do anything beyond claiming a belief in Jesus. Guzik, he goes on to say, deep down there is no more miserable than the lukewarm Christian. They have too much of the world to be happy in Jesus, but too much of Jesus to be happy in the world. The believers didn't take a stand for anything. Indifference led to idleness. By neglecting to do anything for Christ, the church has become hardened and self-satisfied, and it was destroying itself. There's nothing more disgusting than a half-hearted, in-name-only Christian who is self-sufficient. Because we are called by Christ to be reliant on him. And that's what Jesus has a command. He tells this church, there's still hope for you. Yes, I want to spit you out of my mouth, but I still have a plan for you. You can still turn back. And there is still hope for Christians today. There's still the opportunity to become what Christ is calling you. And we see that in verse 18 of Revelation 3. I advise you, buy gold from me, refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. And so this church, they thought they were rich. They thought they were wealthy. They thought they weren't in need of anything. But Jesus tells them the opposite of this. He tells them, you're wretched, you're poor, you're miserable, you're naked, and you're blind. But he gives them hope, and he gives them a direction. He says, turn back to me. Come back to me for the needs of your life. That is where your hope is going to be found. Rely on me for everything. And this is where I got to thinking, we really need to do a heart check in this situation. Because I don't know how many people would actually say, yep, I'm a lukewarm Christian. Nobody wants to be that. This church probably didn't think they were a lukewarm church. But Jesus has the words that says, no, 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 you are a lukewarm church. And so we need to check our hearts and we need to pray, God, show me in my heart where I am not fully stepping in faith following you in faith. Show me where I am not fully committing my life to you, where I am just kind of sitting back and being a spectator. Because Christ is the one who truly evaluates our life, and we need him to speak the truth into us. Because again, this church thought they were amazing. They thought they were doing everything right. But Jesus had some very sobering words for them. And he said to come to him. He told them, buy your stuff from me, and I will give you the true riches. I will give you gold refined in fire. Come to me, and I will give you not black garments that represent death. I will give you white garments that are representing life, life that you will find in me. Come to me, and you will not have shame in your nakedness. I will bring to light things that you are blinded to. That's where we need to come to Christ. But these are things that they could not work for. He said, buy from me gold that is refined in fire. Well, that makes me think, well, I got to earn it. You cannot earn it. You cannot work enough to receive it. You'll be working for eternity and still never be able to pay it off. But all these are presented to you through the price that Christ paid on Calvary. As God said in Isaiah 55, 1 through 4, he said, ho, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. The only place that you can find true riches is at the throne of Jesus. 
And we need God to help us to see these truths. We need to ask God to reveal these truths to us because we can easily be blinded to it. Because the scariest thing about the church of Laodicea, as I was reading through it, is that they didn't think they were lukewarm. They thought they were doing it all right. They thought they were great. And it's scary to me to think how many people are out there thinking, yes, I've got it. It's, you know, they're just saying, I believe there is a Jesus. They are missing out on the true call that Jesus has for them. They are living their lives as lukewarm Christians, and they're not even aware of it. They're thinking, I can do the bare minimum, and I can get away with it. But they don't have that abundant life that Christ is calling them to have. They keep one foot in the world, and then they're like, well, I'll keep one foot in Christ, but I, I still want to be a part of the world, so I'm going to keep one foot in the world. But notice in verse 19, these are harsh words that Jesus has for this church, but Christ says them because of his love for the church. It's not that he hates this church, but it's his love for the church, that he doesn't want to give up on Laodicea, but he wants to have hope. He wants them to have hope. And so he shares it. In 319, it says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. And then he says, Therefore, be zealous and repent. So because of the love that Jesus has for this church, he has to say this to them. He can't just let it go. Sometimes we think, well, loving them is just going to let everything go. No, sometimes truly loving them is speaking the hard words into their life. For who would see a house on fire and be like, eh, the owner's got it. They might still be sleeping, but eh, they'll figure it out. No, you're going to go find out if anybody's in there, and you're going to try and help them. You might have to kick down a door to do it, but you will see that lives are at stake through that. And the command from Jesus is simple. He said, go out to a hurting world, and he said, go with passion. How many times do we think, well, I'll go out, yeah, it's all right, yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm not going to get excited about that. I'm not going to get invigorated about that. If somebody's just like, yeah, he's good. You know, Jesus, yeah, it's whatever. No, go with passion. We are called to be cold or hot water. We are called to bring the healing and the comfort and the restoration to a hurting and broken world as hot water does to a hurting and broken body. We are called to be cold water to some to invigorate, to energize, to uplift, to bring new life, and to encourage them. Christ called us to go out and share his love with people. We need to serve a purpose because we are called to a higher purpose. We are not called to be lukewarm, to just sit idly by and watch the world burn. And so as I was watching this, uh, Ray Vanderlyn, he was talking about this church, and he asked some questions that I thought were pretty convicting to me. He said, when was the last time you brought the comfort of the love of Jesus to a hurting person? When was the last time you were cold water, bringing life to someone and encouraging someone who was discouraged? When was the last time you gave someone the, new, the taste of new life in Christ? And it was like, man... I hope that I do that daily. I pray to do that daily. And then he went on to say, the main way to do this isn't by building a bigger, fancier building. It isn't by sitting idly by waiting. It isn't by incorporating new programs, but rather you are the difference. It is by you allowing the work of Christ in your life to flow over to other people. He said it takes personal, person-to-person -person interaction. And I received an email the other day. Many of you remember Nathan Bolt. He was the one who did our revival. And uh, he sends me a lot of emails that, like, are newsletters of their church. And this one I thought was super interesting. And it was one on stats of visitors coming to church for the first time. And it was, uh, the research was conducted by a guy named Brian Cutshaw. And it said 2% of people who go to church for the first time came because they were enticed by a program. 3% had a need met by the church. 6% walked in on their own initiative. 10% liked the preacher. 83 per, or no, 
of people who come for the first time came because they were invited by a relative. I thought that is a huge gap. It's that person to person interaction. We see in the life of Elijah two different times, once in 1 Kings, once in 2 Kings, where there is a boy who is dead. And they come to Elijah, and they're asking Elijah to bring life back to the boy. And Elijah, he does something that's kind of interesting, and I think if I saw doctors try this today, it'd be really weird, but Elijah gets away with it. Because what Elijah does is he climbs on top of the boy, both times, and he lines up face to face, feet to feet, hands to hands. He mimics the boy. And he brings life into the boy. Both times that happens. And so to bring people to life in Jesus, it takes putting life on life. It takes personal interaction. It takes a personal invite. Christ never called for us to be idle. He never called for us to be secluded. He never called for us to worry only about ourselves. He gave us the great commandment. He called the 72 to go out. He gave the great commission. He told us, be a light in the world. Don't just be a light in your home. Be a light in the world. Be used by Christ. We're called to make a movement for Christ. You, each one of you are called to glorify Christ in every aspect of your life. Center Christian Church, I was thinking about this as I was listening to one pastor preach. He said, we are not a church of one pastor, but instead we are a church of pastors. Every single person has the same command, go and share the gospel. Ministry is not a vocation, it is a life. I am not the only one called to ministry. I am the one that does it from this platform. Everybody is called to ministry. And so I want to ask you, and I've been asking myself the same question, what does your spiritual thermometer say about you? Are you hot or cold for Christ, or are you just sitting idly by? What are you basing it off of? Are you basing your temperature off of the things that you do and totally missing out on the relationship with Jesus? Or are you basing it off of, yeah, I believe there's a Jesus, but I am doing nothing for Jesus? Or are you basing it off the work that Jesus is doing in your life and who he is to you? There is a great multitude that followed Jesus at one time. He had 500 people following him. He then shared one message with them. He said, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to eat my body and drink my blood. And just like that, his following dropped down to 12. And so he turns to Peter and he asks him, Peter, are you going to leave me? And I love Peter's response in John 6, 68 through 69. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter knew it wasn't about anything Peter could do. He was just going to stay with the one who could do it all. He was going to cling to Christ and do whatever it is that Christ called him to do. And this is what we are called to do. To just be available for Christ and go where he leads us and answer his call, bringing healing to a hurting and broken life and bringing encouragement to those who are brokenhearted. Because even to this church in Laodicea, that Jesus said he wants to spit out of his mouth, he still gave an invitation to them. I'm not done with you. Come back to me. You can never run far enough from God's grace. You can never sin big enough for it to not cover you. There is always that invitation. Jesus says, no, as long as you are breathing, I want to use you. I have a purpose for you. I have a calling for you. Go and be a light to the world. And then in Revelation 3.20, he gave that invite. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me. Father God, 
you have offered the invite. You said anybody who opens their heart to you, you will enter in. But we have to let you in. And so, God, I pray that if there be anybody in this building who has not opened their heart to you, God, knock. You are knocking. Give them the courage to open their heart to you. Give them the confidence and the faith to let you in. And then, God, may we boldly follow you wherever it is that you call us, and may we live lives of ministry right here to hurting and broken people that we know who need your touch, who need your grace and your love. And so, God, may we go from here entering into just continuing in ministry. And God, show us maybe just one person that we can extend and be either hot or cold water to them, either bringing healing to them or giving them life that is found in you. God, speak to us, and it's in your name we pray.